We are delighted again to be joined by the Alabama Department of Labor's Workers' Compensation Division, who will provide us information that will be very helpful on the ombudsman program with their department. And so now it's my pleasure to introduce you to John Lewis, who is the director of the Alabama Department of Labor Workers' Compensation Ombudsman Program. So John, take it away. Good afternoon, everybody. I am, as Alina said, I am the director of the Ombudsman Program here today, and I'm delighted to be here and glad to share with you what we do here and see what we might able to be of help to you. First of all, the Ombudsman program is housed within the Department of Labor. Um, the Ombudsman group was formed in 1993. That came out of a couple of special sessions of the legislature to come up with a way to handle workers' compensation claims. As you know, before the 1992 legislation, all claims had to go into circuit court. The um, Ombudsman program allows for the issues or uh, disputes that come up in workers' compensation to re be resolved through the ombudsman program through mediation. But that's what we're going to be talking about today on the screen. You see some of our contact information and if we'll go to the next screen, we will to the next slide, we will get started here. What is an ombuds ombudsman? <clears throat> an ombudsman is a state merit system employee, basically meaning that you would have to go to through state personnel to get on the register. Luckily, the ombudsman uh, register is continuously open. So if anyone's interested in uh, applying to be an ombudsman, go to state personnel and fill out an application, and we will be glad to consider you. What we do here is provide ombudsman or mediation services for any person that's involved in a workers' compensation claim, whether it be an employer, claimant, whoever, whoever's involved in a workers' compensation case, uh, get in contact with us and uh, there's probably a service that we can provide for you, okay? Um, Next thing. What we have here, I always like to start out with the lighter note, but what I, what you're looking at, there's a little cartoon and I put that in just to show you that little guy that's walking down the hall there, he has some uh, issues. Uh, and the hole in the floor is that dark hole of litigation. And the point that I tried to make with that cartoon is that we hope to try and help you avoid falling down that dark hole of litigation. We can provide you with a mediation service here at the Ombudsman Program. Okay. We have Ombudsmen that are geographically located throughout the state. We have them in the major metropolitan areas. We have two in Mobile, two in Birmingham, two in Huntsville, and we have four here in Montgomery. So we'll be putting up a map and show you how they are located in their territories. That's our case volume, and I always like to put that up to try to toot our horn a little bit. Uh, in 2019, we handled 2,278 uh, mediation that, mediations, and we resolved 93% of them. Of course, court order mediations, we handle less of those, but uh, the ombudsmen have been certified to handle uh, cases through the appellate level. But in 2019, we had 59 court order mini, uh, mediations and we resolved 63% of them. But that's just to show you the kind of volume that we do here and how we get them resolved or the resolution rates that we have and handled in mediations here. Okay, next screen. What we're gonna be talking about today is taking you through some of what we do and how we do it. We're gonna look at what a benefit review conference is, what a mediation is, what the ombudsman role is, how it works, how long it takes, who pays for it, and how do you how would you how you would request the mediation. And of course the benefits of mediation. But we'll get started with that and we'll go through that and uh, hopefully we can shed some light on what we do, how we do it, and how it might work for you. That is a map that outlines the state, how it's broken up. Uh, at the top, 
the yellow portion of the map, that's North Alabama tier. We have two ombudsmen up there. We have Tanya Denson and Robert Tom, uh, Thomas. Uh, green area, that's the Birmingham area. Um, that is Patricia Fraley and Ted Roos. And of course, in the Montgomery area, which is a broader area that's outlined in blue, a lot of the area that we have here is not that well populated. So we have a larger area here, but we are able to cover it all though. And of course, in South Alabama, uh, we have two ombudsmen down there. So if you, anywhere that you are in the state, we can uh, get an ombudsman to you rather quickly. That's one of the things that we pride ourselves on is that we have flexibility. So if, uh, you're in the state or if you're handling cases uh, anywhere in the state, just give us a call and we can get somebody there for you. Okay, next screen. What are the benefits of mediation? One of the bigger benefits is that cases are handled quickly. As I mentioned earlier, before the 1992 legislation, all, four, all cases had to go to the circuit court. But we are here and we can usually get you into a get you set up for a mediation rather quickly uh, another re, another uh, benefit of it is that the expense of litigation is reduced uh, the program that we run here is a free program it's provided by the state of alabama free to any person that's involved in a workers compensation case so and i'll be talking about that or you'll hear me saying that more that's one of the things that we'd like to put forth is that the program is a free program that's provided uh, by the state of Alabama for anyone that's involved in a workers' compensation claim. One of the other reasons that I think that mediation is important, that it improves the lines of communication. Mediator, mediation allows you to come in and sit down with the parties involved, the decision makers that are involved in the case, and you... <laughs> Wow. a better resolution uh well a quicker resolution not a better resolution i should say another uh benefit of it is that you have the continuing relationship aspect of it lots of times you will have a settlement on a workers compensation case and you might not settle all of the issues and there are ongoing issues that you're going to have to work through in the future and if we can come in and keep it cordial and work out some of those issues, it makes it much easier to continue that line of communication for whatever other issues that might be at hand in that case. Mediation is flexible with us as, we, as I've mentioned before. We can set them up relatively quickly and we have people that are stationed throughout the state. So if you give us a call, we can generally get it set up within a week or two. Uh, no longer than that, hopefully that we will be able to give you a date. Uh, sometimes depends on the time of the year because as we all know towards the end of the year, this time of the year, things will pick up. But generally we are able to handle our cases relatively quickly though. Okay, next page. What is the benefit of a benefit review conference on mediation? Me, uh, what is the what is a benefit review conference on mediation? Benefit review conferences are what we do when the parties have reached an agreement. Generally, what happens is if there's an agreement in place already, the parties will call us and ask us to come in as opposed to going to court. Uh, of course, you always have the right to take any uh, case that's resolved to court, but the statute allows an ombudsman to come in when the parties have reached an agreement and the ombudsman will prepare the documentation that finalizes the settlement of that workers' compensation uh, claim. The role of the ombudsman is a neutral in mediation. We come in, we are neutral third party. So we like to tell everybody that uh, call us, we will come in, we don't take a side, we don't have a dog in the fight. We are, the, we are a neutral third party. We are there to get the parties together to try and get them to move toward a settlement in the case. Whatever that might entail, we are there to do it. Mediation can take 
I always tell people, I always generally set aside two hours. Now, that doesn't mean that mediations don't run longer than that. Quite a few of them do. But we are going to be there for the duration of a mediation. Mediations can begin quite harmoniously and go to something else. So I don't like to put a time frame on it, but I would always say that you need a minimum of two hours coming into a mediation so that everybody would take uh, set aside that time frame and look at that time as dedicated to trying to get that case resolved. Who pays for mediation? Mediation, again, is free. That is one of the things that the act was designed to do to provide a program that was free to the public. So we are free. There's no cost to any party. So again, it is free. If you want to request an ombudsman, you can get in contact with us. And as the map that I'm going to leave up at the end of this presentation, it'll have all the contact numbers. You want to contact somebody in the area that you are in, or you want to contact the people here in Montgomery. We have administrative assistance here that can assign cases out to people. So if you want to request a mediation, I'm going to show the forms at the end of this that you can use, or you can call us directly. And once you do that, we will begin the process. Okay. Next ring. Let's look at some of the mediation rules that uh, we like to go by. First of all, you have to have an agreement between the parties. If the parties won't agree to mediate that, there cannot be a mediation. Usually we will tell people that when they call us that if you talk to the other party, if they're agreeable, or if you can call us and we will call the other party to see if they are agreeable to mediation. Upon the agreement to mediate, of course, you would again give us a call and uh, we will have someone here to select a mediator. And I wanted to talk about that a little bit because if you're in an area and you look at the map and you think that that mediator or both of the mediators or three of the mediators, whatever the case might be in that area, might have some conflict, if you will call me, we will make sure that uh, we will assign another mediator. I know that people um, that do this a lot, they are familiar with the ombudsman and they know each ombudsman tendencies and how it will relate to that case. But if you don't have an ombudsman in the area that you um, feel comfortable with, give me a call and we will be able to work that out for you. We like to have a flexible schedule and we're talking about rule four talks about schedule and I've touched on some of that before. But scheduling is generally flexible. If you call us and get a mediator, it shouldn't take you that long to do it, to get it set up. Rule five has to do with um, whether mediators or whether the ombudsman wants you to send submissions. Some ombudsmen do, some don't. I will leave that to them. And when you talk to them, you all can work out whether you want to send submissions on the case. Generally, if it's a complicated case, there are a lot of issues, an ombudsman will ask you to submit uh, something about your position on the case, a position paper, a brief, whatever you would like to term it. But um, we would um, we would work that out in talking to the people that are involved. And like I say, if it's a um, case that has a lot of issues going on and uh, there are quite a few disputes, uh, we will ask you to submit a brief outline of your position in the case. We'll ask that generally from both parties so that we are aware of all of the issues and those issues are, and those briefs that you send to us are confidential. We won't divulge them to the other side unless you tell, it so, tell us that it's okay. Okay, next screen. The authority of the mediator. The 
mediator has the authority to start a mediation. The mediator has the authority to end the mediation also. And I point that out to say this. With mediation, as I said earlier, they can start out harmoniously, but they can uh, go to something else. One of the reasons that we would uh, end a mediation, if it doesn't appear that the parties are moving towards settlement and, and in, on the uh, issues that are involved, I will tell this story, a quick story about a mediation that I was involved in some years ago. We had a mediation, we started it out, went to the first caucus, and in that, at the end of that first caucus, we had to take the claimant out, she was taken out in a straitjacket. So things can happen in a mediation that uh, the ombudsman would be forced to end it, or he would think that, he or she would think that it would better be better to end it. And one of the major reasons that we will normally end a mediation is that we're not making progress. Doesn't mean that we will end it, but we will adjourn it for that time if parties want to get back together again. We are certainly willing to do that. But uh, the mediator has the authority as to how the mediation it, uh, is to be ran. So just be aware of that. And I think that if everybody comes to the mediation with an open mind, if everybody comes there, uh, the uh, insurance company, uh, defense attorney, whoever comes to the mediation, if they come there with authority to settle and if the claimant comes there with an open mind, we will not have to stop a mediation. We will see it through. I always tell people that a good mediation is when everybody walks away a little bit mad because mediation deals with the art of compromise. So everybody's going to have to give a little bit here and a little bit there in order to get it settled. Rule seven has to do with privacy. Mediation is designed basically for the parties that are involved in it. We understand that parties might want to bring somebody else to mediation. I always tell people that we are looking for the people that are the parties to the mediation that day. People will bring, want to bring their mothers, fathers. I've had been in mediations where a claimant wanted to bring his pastor in. But I must say with that mediation, with a lot of old searching, I guess is the best way to put it, we were able to get it settled. But it's up to the other side as to what those people will be allowed in. So just uh, bear that in mind when you schedule a mediation. Be aware of the people that you're talking about wanting to be there because it's up to the other side as to whether they will allow attendees there. Rule eight has to do with confidentiality. <clears throat> a lot of times people will call here and want different things from us, but the once a case is settled, we are the custodian of record here. Those records are to be divulged only to the parties that are involved with them unless there is a subpoena. As of now, the statute says that uh, we don't have to disclose any information. All the uh, working papers, the agreements, they are confidential, so we are not required to divulge any of that kind of thing. And that is the position that we take until the courts rule otherwise, but we have not had a problem with that uh, in the past. Okay, next screen. There is no record kept of the um, mediation. <clears throat> that we will be keeping records or making notes while we are in the mediation, but all of those records are privileged. And when we put them in our system, they are, they are privileged information, but uh, there will be no record. There will be no recording of the mediation. The only thing that should come out of the mediation, if it is sell, is the settlement agreement that everybody will look at, agree to the language, sign off on it, and each participant will have a copy of it. Uh, otherwise, all our stuff is confidential and we will not be giving it to any parties except those that were involved in the mediation unless it's by subpoena. Rule 10 has to do with the councils that are involved in a mediation. Either party can be uh, represented at a mediation. Um, if you are not represented, generally if a claimant is not represented, 
we have to make sure that that claimant is aware that uh, they have a right to representation and that will be documented by an affidavit that's notarized. But every party that's in mediation has a right to counsel, counsel right. Rule 11 has to do with the settlement. If a settlement is resolved, we will reduce it to writing and all parties will have an opportunity to participate in the writing of the agreement. And I mean by that, make sure that the writing of the settlement agreement is to your satisfaction. You have an opportunity to review it, to make sure that the issues that you think are settled are settled as you thought they were. Once that everybody has viewed the document and everybody is in agreement that the document is sound, everybody will sign off on it and that will resolve the mediation and we will terminate it at that point. Um, it will be over and settled and done. Okay, next screen. What we're looking at there is a form that we use to have people to request a mediation. As I said earlier, you have the map with everybody's contact information, email, phone numbers. Lots of times that form is used by adjusters, not just the, not only adjusters, but we get that form from adjusters. And that form is sent to us when they settle the case with the claimant, requesting an ombudsman to come in and settle and meet with that claimant and get the paperwork done to get it resolved. Anyone can send that uh, form. We would like for attorneys to send that form if you would get your paralegal or whoever does your paperwork to send that to us. We will start to build a file. But that's the form that starts the process in getting an ombudsman. I, what we're looking at is the form there that we use to allow people to request an ombudsman. Like I said, uh, I said earlier, I don't know where I got cut off at, but uh, that form lots of time is used by uh, adjusters and they use it if they are dealing with a claimant that's not represented and they reach an agreement. The statute allows us to come in when the parties have reached an agreement to finalize that agreement. And that's a form that adjusters use lots of times to send uh, the information that we need to get in contact with that uh, claimant to start the process of meeting with him and getting the paperwork done and uh, sent back to the adjuster to sign off and finalize the case. But anyone can use that form. Uh, attorneys, if you would like to send that to us and, as opposed to just calling for uh, an ombudsman in that area or in your area, or if you don't know an ombudsman in the area where the mediation is going to you can send that to us and we can use that documentation to get a number from the sign to you. Of course, we will call you and see if you have a preference or anything of that nature. But if you don't, we will get enough. Okay, can you hear me again? Okay, that is the affidavit form that we use. Generally, that form is used if a claimant is not represented. The statute says that if a claimant is not represented, he has 60 days from the uh, date of the agreement to petition a court to set it aside. That has happened, but it does not happen much. But the statute says that we have to present and get that affidavit signed and notarized. And that's simply to notify the claimant or tell them of their right to counsel. And that's what we use that for. Okay, next slide. Next slide. That is our memorandum agreement. That is the form that we use to outline the settlement. If you look at the top portion of the form, it has a heading that uh, lists the parties that are involved, the injury date and the social security number uh, the, of the claimant. 
we have a system that still operates off that, so we need that. And generally, when we come into a mediation, we will ask the parties uh, for a first report of injury if we don't have one on file. That will happen occasionally, but if there's not a first report of injury on file, that is not a bar to us to come in and mediate a case. The next section, section that says issues outline the issues that are uh, up for settlement in a general workers' compensation case. And we will sell all a uh, part of those issues that are uh, outlined on that form. And it also has other at the bottom there. So I don't know what other issues that might come up what we might have left off that form, but we have a box that's a check for others. And the middle portion of the form, that's where the settlement uh, language goes, whatever we have, whatever the parties agree to, it will be documented in that section. Um, and everybody signs and it becomes an official document and we will file it back here. Okay, next slide. That kind of takes you all through what we do here, I hope, and if there are any questions, certainly we'll entertain those. But that takes you through what we kind of do here in a nutshell. And I would encourage anyone that's listening today to use our services. As I said earlier, and I kept reiterating, it is a free service. So if you're on the on the ride that you're thinking like the little guy in the cartoon is gonna lead you to that giant hole in the floor towards litigation, I ask you to get off uh, this exit and try us and let us try and mediate your case and try and get it resolved for you. Okay, next slide. Again, that's the map that I'm going to leave there for a while that tells you how all, where all the ombudsmen are, how you can get in contact with them. So if you need us, feel free, feel free to give us a call. Okay. What we also have some, okay, we have uh, uh, Robert Thomas, we call him Bobby. He's up in the northern tier of the state. He's in Coleman, Alabama, but Coleman North, he handles that area and some areas south. Bobby, if you tell us something about yourself and uh, what you have to talk about today. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as John said, I'm Robert Thomas. Uh, I go by Bobby. Uh, my background, uh, I practiced law for 30 plus years uh, in Shelby County, Alabama. I still reside in Shelby County, which as a lot of you know, is just south of Birmingham. So my territory is north. But uh, since I practice in the work comp field for 30 plus years, there's a lot of lawyers in the Birmingham area that know me. And when I have open dates, if they want to utilize me, I try to do as many phone BRCs as we can right now in mediations. Uh, my background, as I said, uh, was predominantly work comp. I practiced in the area of uh, plaintiff's work comp the first five, six years of my practice. Uh, the last 25 plus years, uh, my, uh, the law firm uh, that I'd started back in 94, we did predominantly insurance defense work in the work comp field. Uh, I retired a few years ago and uh, this job came a calling. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, profession. We have a number of fine folks, some are lawyers, some aren't that are ombudsmen, but uh, I believe uh, it's a great service. I utilize it as a lawyer for 25 plus years. I know how wonderful the program is and I'm glad to be part of it. Uh, so if any of you need me, there's a telephone number uh, listed on the geographic Alabama chart. I also um, have a cell phone that I utilize for most of my uh, business work and that number is 205-966-1253. So today, what I wanted to talk about, John has given us an overview. Uh, I want to kind of focus predominantly on, on two areas. One, that being rule five, uh, dealing what I call with uh, uh, mediation preparation, and then kind of finish out on pandemic uh, changes to BRCs and mediations. Uh, 
first of all, being a lawyer, I, I routinely sent out position statements. So that's something I'm real big on. So the way I start uh, mediation, BRCs are much different. It's mainly just getting signed documents in and getting everyone together over the phone, whatever it may be, and conduct your BRC and uh, sign off on the documents. Now, the, the mediation itself, of course, is a much more involved process. It begins with legal assistance, getting dates. Once we've confirmed a date, what I like to do is get that mediation schedule. John had placed that on the board. It has a significant amount of information. That's kind of like where I start. Of course, not all the mediation schedules are that uh, detailed, but um, I like to have you know everyone's name, uh, dates of injury, uh, employer, employee, the parties, date of injury, last four digits of social security number, uh, anything, the location of the BRC, I like to have all that. Now, the, the document John showed you gets very detailed into average weekly wage and numbers, and I'll talk about that a little bit later in a minute. But mainly, I just like to know who's involved and where it's going to be and the time, and uh, maybe if there's an impairment rating. And then what I routinely do once I get that, I send the lawyers uh, involved in the case an email and say, look, I would really appreciate any records, documents, um, and a short, concise position statement setting out uh, some of the facts, uh, the contested issues, uh, some of the what I call numbers, average weekly wage, uh, TTD weeks paid, uh, if there's impairment ratings, um, I'd like to have that. But usually that can be done unless it's a, a, a very difficult case, usually no more than a page or two. It just gives me an overview of what I'm coming into. And while we're all short of time because we're trying to do so much these days, it helps me to prepare once I have the schedule, get it on the calendar, because all of us make mistakes on calendaring. So if we got that schedule, it's pretty much guaranteed we know when it's going to be and know to be there. Now, the position statement kind of gets me setting forth on ideas of how to strategize on the mediation, uh, determine interest in the case. Um, some folks don't like doing it, and it's totally fine. Uh, I have more defense counsel that prepare them than I do plaintiff, but I have some plaintiff counsel. If plaintiff counsel prefers not to, then I usually, a few days before, I'll call them up and ask them if they mind just giving me a few ideas of what, what their thoughts are on the case. Develop if it's most, most of the work comp lawyers in the central north part of the state I know, but the ones that I do not know, it's always good to talk to them to get a little flavor for who they are and some of the issues and uh, to, to confirm that our average weekly wages are right. We like to go in to a mediation, or I do, comparing apples to apples. And so when we get there, you know, we're just talking about closing comp. Okay. So once I have the position statement, I'm then kind of then in a position to run some numbers. And uh, uh, when it gets to the mediation, if I've not gotten something from the plaintiff's counsel, I get with him, get his numbers, make sure we're comparing apples to apples. So, you know, the, these documents, uh, and sometimes plaintiff's counsel sent me disability ratings, all that helps. It helps me prepare. I, that's just the way I like to be. Some ombudsmen don't go into that much detail, but everybody has their own ways and everybody has their uh, proficiencies. Me, I just like to go in prepared. Uh, the last thing that I would like to talk about is just some of the changes we've gone through. I'm the newest ombudsman. I've been here a little less than two years, and the first year and a half before the pandemic, it was up and down the highway and doing a lot of work, uh, both mediation and the BRCs, the settlement conferences. Now with the pandemic and, and some of the orders, uh, Patricia, if you get her audio going, she'll tell you about some of these orders, but the the face-to-face -face mediations are, are still ongoing. We are doing virtual mediations. Uh, the pandemic has significantly changed our program uh, we're all trying to learn how to use Zoom and to use these uh, technologies to our benefit. Uh, it has increased production tremendously. I, I think from talking with other ombudsmen that everybody's 
um, um, efficiency is just about doubled because we can do seven or eight BRCs in a day, whereas if we had to travel to different locations, we may be able to do one or two. So there's definitely some advantages uh, of the virtual. Uh, whether or not this will continue after the pandemic is yet to be seen, but I think we've learned a lot about uh, being more efficient uh, with the use of the virtual technology during the pandemic. So I know Eileen has uh, folks sending in questions. I'll be glad to answer any questions either about myself or, or the program or, or what I do. But I appreciate everyone's attention and thank you very much. Thanks, Robert. This is uh, Robert. Eileen and I do want to let folks know that we do have a question and I'd like to pose it to you all. Um, it's from one of our participants who said, I've had a couple of instances where the ombudsman appears to be chums with the defense attorney and they exchange communications about their previous connections and or firms they've served together. Both times I was unable to settle my case during the ombudsman's interaction because impartiality was placed in doubt. Um, I just wanted you to know about my experience in it and it would be helpful if the ombudsman would consider that idea. So. Um, what can the ombudsman do to ensure that they're um, communicating uh, their impartiality uh, with the participants? Uh, thank you for the question. <clears throat> As I said earlier, we are an independent third party. We do this all the time, so we would know a lot of the attorneys that are involved. And I would say that I hate that you got that impression from an ombudsman that he was uh, chummy uh, with another side, but we deal with uh, the attorneys on plaintiff and defense side uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Some of them, of course, we are more talkative than the others and there might be more conversation going on, but the ombudsman is still an impartial third party and I hate that you got that impression and I'll let uh, Bobby or Pat or Patricia, if you, if you want to chime in on that. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in real quick. Um, I practice in this area of law. I don't know just about as many plaintiffs attorneys as well as I do defense attorneys. So um, uh, since I spoke on the, the uh, pre-mediation workup, uh, not so much the in-person mediation aspect, but of course I know both sides and first and foremost, we're supposed to be impartial. And, you know, when I'm in a, a mediation with somebody, I'm usually cutting up with both sides. So, uh, but uh, when it comes down to the issues and the facts, um, you know, I may know all these guys or women, uh, but uh, the job is to get the case settled. And just because you have conversations maybe in mediation with one side or the other, you know, it, it, you've got to, as part of the mediation process, and you have to do it on both sides, I feel. It's a, uh, both sides have got to be comfortable, especially on the uh, employee side. There needs to be rapport built up with the uh, employee. If I've never dealt with either attorney, I try to develop a little rapport with both. Uh, because if I can't develop a rapport, especially with the, if I know the defense counsel, but I don't know the plaintiff or plaintiff's attorney, uh, then I need to develop rapport. And uh, that will lead normally to a successful resolution or may resolve some issues. But uh, I never uh, would try to be partial to one side over the other. That's against the fundamentals of our program. And I hope that uh, never happens to you again. Um, so, but that, that's my take on it. Oh, yeah, I'll second, I second what Bobby said. Um, I'm sorry to see somebody had that experience. However, lawyers on both sides and ombudsmen and mediators in, in private practice are friends and are acquaintances with people on both sides. So I think the important thing to do is just what Bobby said, make sure it does not affect you, which I know it does not affect myself and any other ombudsman that I know, but perhaps it's better pragmatically not to have opening statements. Uh, and that way you start away from everybody else. Um, that may be better. And I think 95% of the cases are going that way anyway. But I think that's normal that people do get along. And if you do have that experience with somebody who appears to be chummy, it doesn't mean it's automatically biased. And 
I've had that experience in court before where my client thought maybe a judge was friends with the other side. Who knows if it was biased or not, but we hope to all avoid that. And I think one of the ways of avoiding that would be eliminating the, um, the opening statements um, in, in the same room together. Okay. Patrick, thank you for sharing that. Would, would you take a moment and just tell folks about yourself and how you got into the ombudsman program? Sure. So my name is Patrick Pendleton. Um, I am down in Mobile, Mobile, Alabama, the area down here. I'm here with Rudine Crow, who's another ombudsman. So my counties include Clark County, Choctaw, Conecuh, Monroeville, Baldwin, and Mobile, Escambia, and Washington. So we have a pretty good area down here in the southeast. Uh, so a little bit about myself, not to bore you, but I was attorney for 20 years, and I'm a prime example of burnout is real. Um, so I was lucky enough to John uh, took me on as an ombudsman about three years ago. And I cannot say enough about John or the program that he runs because it, it, they really do a great job. I've been all over the country with John at different seminars, explaining our program to different states and hearing from other states how they run their, um, their they don't have ombudsman, but how they want, run their workers comp divisions. And the, the amount of compliments and the amount of people who are impressed with what we do and not charging a fee to people. And then how, how economically we run this. People are very, very impressed. I think we're one of the last people to have an ombudsman. And one of the last folks to have a circuit court decide what happens here. Um, I'll just come in and tell you what I think the best part about our program is, besides the people that are in it. Uh, the best part is that when you have a workers comp case, Anyone that's out there has, has done workers' comp for any length of time knows that the length of case frustration grows. It can grow on both sides, but particularly it grows on the side of the plaintiff, on the injured worker. Uh, you either have a case that takes a long time, like right now with the pandemics pushing everything back. And so what time? Well, the injured worker ends up maybe losing their house, losing their car, and even losing, they leave them or whatnot. I can go on to many things that happens in that length of time, but we have a way to resolve these things very, very quickly. Uh, we meet the folks, we interview the folks, and we do what John said was a benefit review conference. And so we get the case resolved and we sign off on the settlement. And then also, like Bobby was just talking about, if you need a mediation, I can't think of better folks to handle a mediation than the ombudsman because they have all been trained how to be mediators. They've all been trained how to be mediators in the appellate process as well. They all have experience in workers' comp mediation and workers' comp law. Every one of them, I can tell you, is extremely empathetic. They understand the issues, and more importantly, they understand how to deal with people. Um, that is important. Now, we have wonderful private mediators, particularly in my area. A lot of them I'm friends with, they do a great job. But not always can a case warrant spending money on? And uh, we are there for you when that is the case or whenever you just want one of us to do it. So I think it's a very good process. Not only do we do settlements, but we do mediations. Um, that's a little bit about my take on it. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about COVID and kind of how it's impacting the ombudsman program. In short, I think it's making it much better because now through the years of the Supreme Court, we can do all this on a telephone, and we can even notarize through a video type message like we're doing today. If we're going to do a settlement mediation on the telephone or through a Zoom, I want to give you a couple things that we need if we're going to do a settlement. Uh, a note came in asking what information do we need if we do settlement. So I'm going to answer that. The first thing we're going to need is the name of the employee, the correct legal name correct legal name of the name of the employer, the date of the accident, and hopefully the first report of injury because that's very important for our files. You can find that date of the accident, although it may be disputed throughout the case. Whatever the date of the accident says in that first report of injury is what we need to go with for our purposes, as well as the impairment rating that the doctor has provided. Uh, part of the body has been injured. Is it a body as a whole or is it a particular scheduled injury? the amount of the settlement, 
what rights are being closed or left open, uh, other information that we need for settlement purposes. I always like to get a copy of the settlement documents because I like to provide those and make copies for everybody or at least be able to scan them in and then send them out the telephone or do it over the computer. And then John showed before a form of an affidavit that needs to be completed. The affidavit says that they do have a right to representation, that they do believe the settlement is in their best interest, and that they understand that the ombudsman has indeed answered their questions. That needs to be signed and obviously notarized. Uh, like I mentioned, we can actually notarize for the Peter now because of the pandemic. Once a patient, I simply call up the injured worker and I conduct a five, 10 minute, sometimes 15, 20 minute in, uh, interview, answer whatever questions, make sure they understand the settlement, make sure they want to go through with the settlement, sign off and send the documents to everyone. So in short, COVID is actually making the entire process uh, easier. Now, I don't, and, you know, I don't know how long this COVID is going to go on, but we'll get back to the traveling, we'll get back to the in-person settlements. But right now, we can do it over the telephone. Um, as far as the mediation is concerned, I am getting many calls about mediation. We have, well, at least one a day now, the mediating cases that we're doing. So, uh, you know, that is, if anything, it's sped up during the pandemic. So I wanted to give you my telephone number. If you're down here, most people have it. Um, I find it hard to operate with two, just two different telephones. Most folks call my personal cell phone, which is 251-490-9975. 251-490-9975. So call me if you need a settlement or a mediation down here in the southeast part of, uh, of Alabama. Call up uh, Rudine Crow. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Okay, we've got Patricia back. I don't, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you now. We have Patricia Bailey. She's an ombudsman in the Birmingham area. Patricia, if you would tell us something about yourself and the topic that you want to discuss today. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm Patricia Fraley. As you can see, I'm technologically challenged. Um, but I'm glad it's working now. So I am uh, an attorney and I've been practicing law since 1982 and doing specializing in comp since 1985. So I know a lot of folks up here and I've met um, a lot of new people. Um, so that's my background. Um, I've done a, a lot of workers comp and I do a lot of mediations. Um, like Pat said, I probably uh, am scheduling close to one a day. Um, and unlike what John said, I'm booked up for about six weeks unless something cancels. So um, give me a call. And we're doing, a, I feel like about at least 50% more uh, BRCs and settlements than we did uh, COVID. So that has been an interesting um, aspect. So I was going to talk a little bit about why all this is ticked up and what has happened um, during the pandemic. As most of you who are lawyers know, like on March 13th, the court shut down. Um, and so right as the Supreme Court of Alabama issued a lot of administrative orders to um, close the courts, right after that on March 18th, there was a special administrative order um, allowing um, ombudsmen and judges to handle workers' comp hearings and settlements by phone or by Zoom or um, whatever kind of teleconferencing that people use. And to be honest, I use FaceTime a whole lot. And when we do Zoom, other people invite me and set it all up, and I uh, <laughs> that works better than today. So on March 18th, we all got this administrative order with our whole new rules for how to proceed. And the short of it is we can now do settlements, which we call BRCs, benefit review conferences by phone. Um, sometimes those are conference calls with defense attorneys and plaintiff's attorneys and myself and the injured employee. Sometimes it's just me calling uh, the employee who settled. So however, it, the parties feel comfortable in proceeding is fine with me. 
But what has to happen is an ombudsman has to be speaking with the injured employee. And I request all these affidavits, like you just heard Pat and John talk about in the documents, to be signed ahead of time because it pretty it became clear really quickly that if we didn't have signed documents ahead of time and something to talk to these folks about when we're not in person with them, it became just unmanageable. Um, so the law doesn't say that, but for all intents and purposes, I think we're all asking for signed documents to be done ahead of the phone benefit review conference, whether we talk to um, the injured employee and send those documents to them from us to them or whether the attorneys arrange that. So the other part of these administrative orders that came down from the Supreme Court were also uh, ways for um, us as ombudsmen or other people who were notaries to notarize things um, by video conference. And I do that a lot by FaceTime. Most people in this day and age either have an iPhone or have a friend who has an iPhone. If not, that becomes um, a little more complicated. I have found that most people can get things notarized now. Enough stuff is opened up. Their bank or the UPS store that that's not a real problem. But in the beginning, you know, with people who didn't have iPhones, I was just ha having them send me a picture of them holding up their driver's license underneath their chin like a mug shot so that I could compare um, signatures. But it's gotten much, much easier to do these days. So basically that March 18th order that started allowing video conferencing and judges to hold um, um, hearings by telephonically or by video and for us to do the same, that has continued now to the end of the year. The other thing that it's allowing is if an ombudsman oversees a settlement and we sign off on it, now there are provisions to have that be the hearing that a judge would have and to allow a judge then to just dismiss that claim, um, usually upon joint motion of both parties. Um, now that things are opening up more, I'm encouraging people to call and ask their judge what they want to do. Um, but it's worked really pretty well. I mean, usually a defense attorney will do the paperwork, we all sign off on it. They file a joint motion to dismiss with the court with the affidavits and, and all the settlement documents and the things signed by the ombudsman and the judges are dismissing it. Um, and I really fear that people when COVID is over are gonna miss the ability for that to happen, but we'll see what happens after that. I think we're gonna be continuing with this um, way of practicing probably into 2021. Um, but anybody can find those orders if you need them. I'm encouraging people to um, reference to them in the motions that they file with judges, even though the judges know about them. Um, but if you need them, um, call any of us and I'll be happy to send them to you or any of us will send them to you. So thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Yes. Uh, we have, do we have Ted with us today? I'm here. Okay, Ted. You are last but not least. Um, Ted is an ombudsman up in Birmingham with Patricia. And uh, Ted, if you'll tell us about yourself and uh, the subject that you want to talk about here today. Okay. Uh, a lot of the stuff I wanted to talk about has already been covered, so I'll add a few points. but. I started in the claims business in 1973. Uh, back in those days, the comp rate was $65, I think, and there was only four years of medical treatment or 35,000 or 37,000, whichever came first. So it's, I've seen a lot of change. I've done, in my years, I started with travelers and I've had the opportunity. I've worked in Florida. I've seen the Florida system. I've done Tennessee. 
I've had exposure to Kentucky and several other states, and I think our program is far better than anything in any of the other states that we have. Um, as, as we've been saying, we are doing more and more state um, benefit review conferences now by uh, either Zoom, FaceTime, or most of mine are telephonic. Uh, I, I will echo what Tricia says, I like to get the documents at least signed by the employee so they so I know that they've had a chance to review it before okay so in when you call me I would recommend that it, it seems it takes seven to ten days to get the documents circulated and ready for the BRC so please try to take advantage and get that done first uh, I've had several at the last minute call and cancel because they had, don't have the documents, but I, I want to see the documents before we proceed with the BRC and I don't want to spend time chasing down signatures on documents after the BRC. Um, so as Pat, I mean, as, as um, Patricia was saying, you know, with the administrative order, if you've got a case that's pending and it's been resolved, take advantage of the opportunity you have to have us approve it and then file the motion with the court to dis dismiss. Uh, as far as mediation, uh, I'd, with Zoom, I've done some mediations I would prefer if possible to do a zoom and have the employee participate at least in the initial round and then as we go back and forth then it's not as necessary but i'd like to be able to see the employee get a chance to talk to them let them see me uh, but in, in some cases that's not possible if not anything else i'd at least like to talk to them um, the only other thing I can say is when I've been to mediations, a lot of time the third party administrators, uh, as you know now, the, you may be dealing with a third party administrator handling an Alabama claim that could be in South Carolina, North Carolina. It's really helpful if the attorney will have the contact information so that he can get, he or she can get in touch with the adjuster. Uh, particularly if we're getting close and need more authority. Uh, it, I hate having to wait uh, for somebody to get back from lunch to get authority. It just drags things out. But other than that, like John said, we do appellate mediations. So, and, and for free, you can't beat that price. And I guess that more or less concludes what I've got. <clears throat> Thank you, Ted. And at this time, I'm going to ask John and for some closing remarks because it appears that we're at our 60 minutes. John? Okay. Again, thank you all for having us. And uh, I hope we've answered some of your questions about the Ombudsman program. I just want everybody to know that we are here. And again, I would reiterate that we are free. And whatever we can do, feel free to call upon us and let's go and mediate some cases. All right, well, thank you, panelists. This has been a very informative program, and especially these services are great, as, and I can't believe that they're free. So thank you for offering that. Again, thank you everyone for joining us today. We did have some technical issues, but I appreciate everyone's patience as we navigated through those. I want to thank the Alabama State Bar for making this part of their on-demand CLE program. And I also want to thank the dispute resolution section of the bar for co-sponsoring this event. I ask everyone, um, if you would please complete the program evaluation, there was a link in the email that you logged into today at the bottom of that notification. There was a survey through SurveyMonkey for you to complete an evaluation on this program. Please take a moment and give us some feedback. Tell us what you liked or how we can improve. If you have any suggestions for future topics, we welcome your feedback. And with that, I'll go ahead and thank our panelists today and conclude our program. Thank you all. <laughs>